Um, I've got two parts in the presentation that I'm going to show you tonight. First of all, I'm going to give you uh, a little talk for about 20 or 25 minutes about what prints are, uh, what they mean to me, what Japanese prints are all about, and how they're made, and some photographs of the process. After that, I'm going to do a demonstration of printing, so you can see how prints are physically made. Um, I've got stuff set up on a table, and we'll pull it forward. At the, the break between talking about things on the presentation and doing it, if at that point you'd like to all come forward and see it a bit closer, it would probably be a bit better. Because people at the back, you're never going to see anything. It, that, that'd be, it'd be impossible. But if, at, if the point between the two parts of the talk you want to come forward, please do. You, you'll get a better view. There, there are plenty of seats near the front. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, um, my presentation, creating a woodblock print. I thought um, I would put this print up because it's, um, first of all, a pretty picture, I like to think. Um, it reflects some of my interest in, in Japanese printmaking anyway. It has a, a tattoo on it, which is one of the themes that appear quite a lot in my work. And it's also one of three different versions of the same design. And I'll talk about this a bit later on, but the same blocks can be used to make different color versions and different states of prints. We see this quite a lot in the work of 20th century printmakers, particularly people like uh, Yoshida Hiroshi, whose work is upstairs. Um, I'm going to start off with um, a few words on the early um, history of robot printmaking. Um, it, single color printing began in China early in the, the first millennium. It's very difficult to know exactly when they started because very few prints exist from this very, very early period. Um, ink was based on um, charcoal that had been panned down, it panned it down into a powder and mixed with, um, usually with some sort of paste and then printed from a carved wooden block. So the very earliest prints were only in black. There was a black outline and that was the only kind of printing that was available at that time. It was, um, that kind of woodblock printing was introduced into Japan around the 8th century and it was an adjunct to um, Buddhism very often. The images that were printed were often Buddhistic images and these were the things that were distributed by Chinese monks of Buddhism within Japan itself. Skipping forward about a thousand years to the um, beginning of this, to the early part of the 17th century, um, the rise of the ukiyo-e movement meant that there was a new market for prints, and prints became more closely connected to everyday life. Ukiyo-e is a, it's actually a Buddhistic term in, in origin, but what it means is floating world pictures. And for the Japanese, the floating world is the world of contemporary life. It's the world of the everyday, somewhere between hell and heaven. It's the life of normal people. So ukiyo-e can be paintings and it can be prints. And obviously what we're looking at mostly is prints in this context. Um, this is a, a, obviously a black and white image by uh, Hishikawa Moronobu, um, who died in uh, 1694. We don't know his birth date. Um, this one dates to about the, the early 1680s. And at this early period, the techniques of those first woodblock prints has not changed. It's a carved wooden block, which has been inked up with sumi, which is the name for that charcoal-based ink, and then printed. Very simple, very straightforward. Um, the technique of the printing is very straightforward. The technique of the carving is amazingly complex. And this we see again and again throughout the prints that, that we're going to look at. Extremely fine lines. The sensitivity to the, the brush stroke and the way that the carver is able to reproduce a design or a drawing by an artist in amazing detail is what makes Japanese print really interesting. Later on, we'll see a development in, in the printing techniques, and those are the things added together with the carving that make Japanese prints really fascinating. Um, hand coloring was an innovation that began sometime in the early 18th century. We've got a print here by Kiyonobu, of a courtesan with her maid. The courtesan is excessively tall, and the maid is excessively tiny. But you know, you get the idea. 
the colouring here has somewhat faded. It's a bit difficult to know exactly what the, the slightly buff colour originally was. It may have been a fugitive colour like blue or purple. But the, the orangey colour was probably slightly redder than it is now. Um, so originally there would have been quite a few areas of hand colour applied to this print by an artisan in the print workshop. And it's important, and we'll, I'll talk about this more a bit later, that each different job within printmaking at this time was done by a separate artisan. So carving was done by a specific person. And actually, within carving, you very often find that there are master carvers who carve the face details and secondary carvers who carve things like the, the line of the robes or the less important things in the print. The, the detail of things like the face, you can't see it because of the quality of the, of the reproduction, but the detail of the face is very often very, very, very fine. you find that the lines are very often about the width of the human hair. And of course, these are all carved into a wooden block and then printed. So the very best carvers would be involved in perhaps the details of the face, and then the block would be passed to a slightly lesser carver who would complete the block. At this early period, as I said, we're, we're applying colors by hand. So there would be a specific person in the workshop who was paid to fill in the colors. A little bit like coloring in a color book, coloring book now. But I'm pretty sure everybody here has had some experience of coloring books. You know how long it takes to fill it out. So this was not exactly a time-saving exercise in bringing color into printmaking. So there had to be some way to do this a bit faster, to make prints which were colorful but yet quicker. So what they did was, on the right-hand side, they developed the idea of bringing in maybe one or two colors by a system of registration. And I'll show you on the, the block that I've got here how the registration is done. Um, on the, the block itself is carved a right angle and a straight edge, and the paper fits into those registration points every single time. And those points are in the same relation to the image on every single block. So that you have a, a way of, a system of fitting the color onto the print. Now they started off, it, it's called, in this early stage, it's called Benizurie, which means uh, pink or light red printed picture. And Beni is that, it, again it looks slightly orangish in this print, the slightly orangish color on the robe of the, the person in the print. Um, in this one, there is also a slightly grayish green color. And two colors were usually used in contrast. So you'd have a sort of pinkish color and maybe a, a greenish color as a, as a color contrast. Later on, they started to introduce more colors into prints. And eventually, you get to the stage in about here, this is about the 1760s, with an artist like Haranobu, who was able to use multicolor blocks for the first time. And Haranobu is probably one of the people who pushed forward the technical innovations of introducing multicolor blocks to printmaking. Um, again, because of color fading, it's difficult to know exactly how many blocks are used here, but I'm, I'm suspecting it's somewhere in the region of 10 or 50 blocks to give the different colors in this print. Outline block plus others on top. Um, around this period, in the middle of the middle to, towards the second part of the 18th century, artists started to be able to use quite a variety of colors, some of which were fugitive and have faded. And very often from prints in this period, you find it difficult to find blues and purples, for example, because those colors just fade. It's very rare to find them in, in great state. In the 19th century, they introduced colors from the West to counteract this problem. And this is a, a print from the 1880s which shows, obviously, very strong color. And most of these colors are based on aniline dyes, which were produced in Europe or America and exported to Japan. Uh, particularly the purple and the red, uh, and there's a blue called Victoria Blue, which are very, very popular in prints of this period. Because they didn't fade, like the earlier uh, vegetable-based colors. The, um, this print is by um, Hiroshige III. Yes, there were three of them. Um, number one is the best one, and they get worse as time goes on. Um, the first colors that were introduced to Japan uh, as artificial colors were, um, were, in fact, was a Prussian blue in about the 1820s, 1830s. 
which if you have a look in the um, ebb and flow exhibition, there's a, an excellent print of uh, Hoxha's Great Wave, and that print uses Prussian blue to a large extent. Um, Hoxha and Hiroshige were using blue a lot in their prints, and it was the Prussian blue that was imported from Western countries because it didn't fade like either the indigo or the dayflower blue, which had existed in the 18th century. So there's a movement to replace color that was fugitive with color that was more permanent. Um, at this period in the latter part of the 19th century, it tended to be quite strong color that was used, which is perhaps not to everyone's taste, certainly nowadays. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was a decline in the production of woodblock prints. It became very expensive to produce woodblock prints. They were labor intensive, they were time consuming, they were produced by very skilled artisans who required long periods of training. So people started to look for color reproduction to things like lithography. And lithography started to replace um, woodblock prints to a large extent in all kinds of commercial publishing. Around the period of the First World War, people started to think that maybe it would be good to not let this process die in woodblock printing. And two opposing schools started to appear, opposing but yet connected in some way. Um, on the screen, I've got the words sosaku hanga and shin hanga. Hanga is the word for print. Sosaku means creative, and shin means new. So we've got creative prints and new prints. Um, there isn't a, a massive difference between these except in people's minds, I tend to think. Um, what, what really happens is that in the Sosaku Hanga movement, artists are responsible entirely for the process of making the print. So the artist does the carving and he does the printing of his own design. In the Shinhanga movement, which is what we see upstairs in the Fresh Impressions exhibition, a publisher has paid an artist to make a design. He then goes and pays a carver to carve it, and then he goes and pays a printer to print it. In the end, you're left with the same kind of object. It's a printed, wood. It's a printed object from wood, but the, the method and the methodology behind it is different. So here, I've, I've chosen just two fairly random examples. There's a Yamamoto Kanai print of the fisherman, which is quite a famous example from the early period of Sosaku Hanga. And a really excellent print by Ito Shinsu called Looking in the Mirror in 1916. It's one of his uh, very earliest woodblock prints. Sadly, not in the exhibition. It was, it's a great piece. Um, I'm going to talk about Shin Hanga briefly here now. Um, this print is also upstairs. It's uh, the wonderful print of Hodakeyama After Rain by Yoshida. Um, it's just a great masterpiece. I mean, the quality of printing is fantastic. It is better than any printing of any period previously. And Yoshida, I think, for me personally, is one of the greatest artists of woodblock print. He, his sense of atmosphere and, and creation of movement and, and momentum in the landscape is unparalleled. Hasui is also very good, but for me Yoshida is amazing. Anyone who's seen his figure painting upstairs will perhaps disagree. I don't think he was a great figure painter, but he was really good at atmosphere. And a print like this probably has close to a hundred impressions mm -hmm. in order to make the final print. Now I'm not saying from that that there are necessarily a hundred pieces of wood used to make it, because very often the wood is used several times to do the same area but printed differently in shading. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, shading or bokashi in areas like this. Can you see how the color becomes much paler than it is here? This is done by uh, damping the block before you put the ink onto it. You put water onto the block and that resists the ink and then it creates a lighter shade. Mm. So I'll talk, I'll talk about this when we come on to doing the printing. Some people like to think of the idea of wiping the block, but it's not quite true. Mm. I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, Yoshida is a, a little bit of an anomaly in the Shinhanga world because he ran his own studio. Most of the artists of uh, Shinhanga were employed 
by a publisher. And the, the major publisher at this period was Watanabe Shizaburo, and I'll talk about him a bit more afterwards. So Sakuhanga, you can see, is quite different. Yeah. This is a print by um, Ochikoshiro. It's 1945, so here we're just after the war, but the feel is entirely different. The feeling of the block is something that's been worked directly by the hand of the artist. It's, it's a much more direct handling. Some might say crude, I wouldn't like to say that, but uh, some might say that. Um, here he's chosen a, a landscape print of um, the uh, Nijobashi, Nijo which is the, the bridge just outside the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. And it's handled quite creatively, quite roughly, in a sense looking towards Western printmaking. Mm -hmm. The influence of Japanese prints on the West is quite well known. But of course, Western prints had their own influence back to Japan as well. So if you think about prints by, say, the German Expressionist artists or French Impressionists, in fact, I mean, a lot of people were doing more creative prints in the West, and Sosaka Hunger artists were looking at those prints for inspiration. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the four-part process of traditional printmaking. Now, by traditional, I really mean ukiyo-e prints, which we're talking about the 18th uh, 19th century prints, when color separation started to be used, right up until about 1900, and about Shinhanga prints, which go from about the First World War through to maybe soon after the Second World War. So it's mostly the interwar period for Shinhanga prints. Um, there was a four-part production of those prints. Obviously, the, the publisher, as I mentioned, is actually the main person who creates the print. He's the one who decides on what the subject will be, he chooses the artist, he chooses the carver and the, the printers. He's the person who really makes the thing happen. He's the one who comes up with the cash. The artist, of course, is chosen because he can create an image that will be suitable for the people who want to, who may want to buy it in the future. The carver, obviously, is chosen for his quality, and so is the printer. They have to be perhaps the best that's available at any particular time. Um, the stages begin with the commission going from the publisher to the artist. The artist is asked for an ink drawing. And if you look upstairs, there's a, a, a wonderful set of blocks by um, Ito Shinsui of a, a little girl in, uh, it's called, I think it's called the 15th day, or 15th month? Yeah, uh, 15th night. 15th night, thank you very much. The 15th night. So the Shinsui print, 15th night, the blocks exist there, and the key block printed, which is the outline block, shows amazingly fine painted lines. They're not, of course, painted by hand onto the print. They're printed from a wood block. But what Shinsu would have delivered to Watanabe Shosaburo is a thin piece of paper with the design drawn onto it in ink by brush. Um, the design is created by the artist onto the paper. The paper is handed to the professional carver. And the carver would take that thin piece of paper and paste it face down onto a woodblock. <coughs> and the design was then destroyed as the block was carved, because the carver would cut through the print, through, through, sorry, through the original drawing, to make the carving. Um, the printing was done with the assistance of the artist very often. I mean, there's a famous quote by uh, Shinsu where he talks about working with the printer was like a singer and a shamisen player. And the shamisen is the Japanese, uh, looks a bit like a banjo, a stringed instrument. And the singer and the shamisen player have to be very much in tune with each other to work together. Mm -hmm. So that he was working with a printer very much like a singer was working with a shamisen player. The, the two have to be very much in tune. He's right at the printer's arm when he's making the test prints so that he gets the right colors, so that the right feel is created within the print from the colors that are chosen. The final stage, of course, is sale by the publisher. So the man who's put up the money in the first place then has the print ready for sale. Um, in, in the world of um, Shinhanga, very often the editions were in the region of 200, 250 impressions from a particular design. But that was very often repeated, and multiple editions were made from the same blocks if the design proved to be very, very popular. Because publishers, after all, are businessmen, and these are objects that are made to be sold. So very often, multiple editions come from the same blocks. In the ukiyo-e period, 
100 years, 200 years previously, there were no limited editions. It didn't exist. The concept is a Western idea of limited editions. And so in the 18th, 19th century, people just printed the blocks until they couldn't use them anymore, or until people stopped buying the design. At that point, they would stop printing them. But in the 20th century, they occasionally made multiple uh, limited editions from the same block. The image moves is <laughs> Rather strange design. I don't. I don't know how I came up with this. But anyway. um, we, we start off with a publisher who's asked the artist to produce a a design, a, a drawing that will be made into a, a print. The artist hands the drawing onto the carver. The carver checks back with the artist if all of this is right, and he also delivers him an impression of the key block. Now, the key block, as I said, is the outline block that's used to fit all the colors together. It's, the, it's usually gray or black or a subtle color, which is used to fit all the colors together. So once the key block is made, the carver has to go back to the artist and say, OK, so where do you want all your colors to go? What he does is he'll either himself or the printer will print off a large number of, of key blocks onto a separate piece of the paper. And on each piece of paper, the artist would note where he wanted certain colors to go. So if it's a figure print, he might put a certain color on the kimono, or a certain color in the background, or a certain color in the hair, and so on. So each color area would be marked by the artist, and the carver would have given him pieces of paper in order to do that. So that all of that, the, the, the carved blocks, go from the carver, oh, there we are, from the carver to the printer, and the printer works with the artist in order to come up with the final color scheme for the print and the shading that will be used in the final work to give it the feel that the artist thinks he wants. Then all of these final prints finally end up back with the publisher again. So it's a slightly cyclical process that these people are all working together in order to produce the prints that are finally made. Now, I said to you that the artist would um, do a design and it was usually uh, an ink drawing on paper uh, my example is actually uh, a drawing in Conte pencil, because I'm difficult. Um, this was the, the one that I used for the outline of um, this print. And that is the, the, the final drawing that I came up with before we got to the stage of carving. So on the left is the original drawing done from life with the model. And on the right hand side is the hanshita e, which means the outline ink drawing. Okay, this is the one that's destroyed in the carving. Um, I brought some that um, tools with me, so there are a couple on the table, but these are the carving tools that are generally used in the carving process. Um, obviously they're chisels, and the wood is the, the basic thing that is carved into in order to uh, make the, the blocks. Um, that's a Obviously, it's a mallet, which is used with these larger uh, round chisels for clearing up big areas. And then there are smaller chisels and knives for each different part of the process. And this is just a, a selection of different tools. And as I said, there are some here which you can have a look at afterwards. I'm not going to carve today, but you can have a look at the tools if you'd like to. Um, Hangito is the basic carving tool that gives you all the detailed carving. It's a slightly angled blade. Um, and here we've got a right-handed and a left-handed one. I'm actually left-handed, and that is a left-handed blade, and that's a right-handed blade. It's it's held um, in a in a position like that. It's held up and down the way, and you carve with it that way. I'll show you a little bit of that afterwards with the blade itself. Um, the carver would follow the very detailed lines that the uh, painter had given him, and cutting around it with this would give a, a beveled shape to the piece of wood. Not cutting straight down, but slightly angling it. When I was learning carving, I was told to make it, to, to think of Mount Fuji. And the shape of Mount Fuji is the shape that the wood should be. Because when you ink it, what you want is for the ink to flow away from the surface. You don't want the ink to sit on the surface. Because if you over ink, then you get blobs of ink in your printing. So slightly Mount Fuji shape. Uh, the isuki is a, is a flat blade, which is generally used to either clear away um, wood or to sometimes smooth off the, the, the edges of um, carving areas to make them a bit rounded. Um, San Kakuto, the V-shaped blade, was introduced in the 19th century. This is what, if anybody has ever done um, lino cut, this is one of the tools that, that you use for lino cut quite a lot. Um, it, it's not 
an original Japanese blade. They introduced it later in the, in the 20th century as a blade. Um, but it is it's widely used now. In the past, they would have used the, the hangito because it does the same effect. You, you cut a, an angle with that, and it's the same idea. But the, the sankakuto, the V-shaped blade, is often used. And the komaski is the, the rounded chisel, which is used for, for clearing out large areas of wood, especially in the, the bigger um, chisels here. Now, lots of woods can be used for uh, carving. The original wood was uh, solid cherry wood. Um, there are variants nowadays that people can use. You can use cherry ply, so it's plywood on one surface um, and a, a center, perhaps, of um, different, different wood. I mean, quite often magnolia is used. Magnolia ply is the block that I've got with me today. And I'll show you that when we pull it out. It's in the water at the moment, damping, ready for the process. Other fruit woods are used because they're short-grained. Um, birch, box, and cedar, lots of things are used. To be perfectly honest, you can use pretty much any wood, as long as it doesn't chip or crack while you're carving with it. And the finer the grain, the better. Um, that is the, one of the blocks that's going to be used. I'll show you in my, my bit of demonstration. Um, this is printing by the printer. Uh, that's me. Check the hairy arm. Um, the table there is set up in, in my studio to, uh, as it normally is. I'm left-handed, as I say, so I normally have my Baron, which is the printing tool, on my left side. Most right-handed printers use the Baron on their, in their right hand. I'm, I'm ambidextrous with printing, but I always have it on my left side. So here you can see this is the back of a print, which I'm actually printing at the moment. Underneath is a block. Obviously, that's the brush that I've used. This is where the, the baron, which is in my hand, would normally sit. I've got a water brush here. I've got nori, which is uh, rice, rice starch. And that's the medium that we use for printing. And I'm printing with two different colors. Um, the, I've written seasons, uh, printing materials, that's what I was just talking about. The, the printer's day, I'm going to skip this for time reasons. Seasons is speed of printing. It tended to be that people would print only in the cooler months. So summer was not usually a printing season because it's very hot in Japan during the summer and it's very humid. So people tended to do other jobs during the summer. I, very often printers would also work as carvers or they'd go and do entirely different jobs. So for a few months in the summer, there wasn't much printing. Then in the, in the fall, winter and spring, most of the printing was done. Um, Standard ink. Sumi is the basic ink of Japanese printmaking because it's the outline ink. It's the one that's used around about the design to fit all the colors together. Powder pigment. Sometimes the, the powder pigment is the same stuff as people use for like poster paints. It's, it can be from Western colors. It can be from Japanese colors. As long as it's color fast, it's, it's very useful. I'm going to demonstrate today with gouache uh, or watercolor because that's also very useful. It's already got a binder mixed into it, so it's quite handy. And nori, which is the thing on the left-hand side there, is the starch from rice paste. Now, obviously, in Japan, because people eat rice on a daily basis, there is a constant supply of, of the starch from the rice. It's basically what you get when you boil it. You just pour it off, and it's, sorry, before you boil it, rather, you pour it off, and that's the, the, the medium. This is used because if you, if you boil rice and you let the pot dry and it has that horrible skin, hard skin around the edge, that's the property that people wanted in printmaking because they want it to be waterproof and not water soluble. So rice paste is mixed in with it in order to make the colors color fast. And then you can build layer upon layer of color. If you just used uh, watercolor, for example, it wouldn't, it wouldn't set properly. You'd be printing and the color would be coming off. So the nori is used to get uh, Solidity. Um, there are special effects available in printmaking. Uh, mica, which you see on quite a few prints upstairs, it's a very thin, uh, a very, very fine silica powder, which gives a shine on the surface. You can print with gold leaf. It means really basically laying down a, a, an adhesive and putting the gold leaf onto it. And embossing, which is printing without color. So you press the block onto a carved area. Sorry, you press the paper onto a carved area of the block which has no color on it, and then give a three-dimensional effect to the surface. These are the Baron. The, the, the Baron is a printing tool. The top three are Hon Baron, which is, uh, sorry, the, top, the left four are Hon Baron, which is a real Baron, or the original Baron, which is a, a lacquered disc with a string inside and then covered in a piece of 
uh, bamboo sheath. It's the, the covering that goes over each section of the bamboo and normally breaks and falls off as the bamboo grows. And then the, uh, on the right hand side, I've got two modern barren, ball bearing barren, and I've got examples of all of those to show you in person, which we'll see in a bit. Um, people like uh, Toshi Yoshida use things like uh, a bag of string or a wooden spoon as printing things. These are innovations of the um, Sosaku Hango, the creative print movement, to use something away from a barren, which gives a different printing effect. Brushes are generally made of horse hair. Uh, the top two are actually goat hair, and they're called mizubake, which is a water brush. And the bottom ones are all made of horse hair. Um, the left-hand side ones are the traditional Japanese ones, and the, the right-hand side ones were introduced at the end of the 19th century, originally as brushes for shoes, but adapted by the Japanese to printmaking. They're also the same kind of brushes that people brush horses with. If anybody has any contact with horses, you've seen something very similar. <coughs> um, the printer's date. The paper has to be prepared. I did this a bit earlier. You see that the paper I'm using is damped. It's pre-damped and ready. Um, I've soaked the block. There's a blue, a blue container there which has the block in it. And the brushes have been soaked. I took those out just before I started. So they're all damped and ready to go. You need water because to transmit color from the block into the paper, it all has to be damp. Everything needs water to move. That's what the table looks like if I'm printing it at home set up with a block in the center. Here I'm applying the ink and the nori to the surface of the block. The ink and the nori are not pre-mixed. You mix them on the surface of the block because if you pre-mix them they dry out far too quickly and it becomes a gunky mess that you can't print with. That's me smoothing it with a brush. Uh, it's obviously quite a large area so I'm, so I'm using a larger brush, the type that was originally introduced as a shoe brush. Paper is piled on the right hand side here, obviously today I've got just a few prints and they're a bit smaller than the ones that I was printing there, but they're stacked between damp sheets of paper in order to keep everything nice and damp while you're working. Now I said to you before that the Japanese invented the idea of registration, it's called kento, and this is the right hand corner kento. So that's my, again, hairy thumb holding my piece of paper and about to fit it into the kento. You can see on the, the block, there is a, luckily it's still got some ink on it. This is the right hand area, and the print just fits into there. That's me fitting it into the kento. And if you look at the left side, my thumb is guiding the left hand kento, which is a straight edge into position. Then it's pressed, rubbed with the baron on the back. The pressure on the back of the print presses it hard into the wood, and that's what causes the ink to go into the depths of the paper. Removing the print from the block, you can see it's got some colour on it, and that's the completed print. Um, this is the key block on the left-hand side, so that's the outline block in black ink, and the impression that it makes, which is quite a pale impression in this case. That's the flesh tone, and the flesh tone area printed onto the block. Obviously everything's in reverse, so when you're carving, you're working in a, in a reverse image to the final image that will be produced. And that's a shading area to give uh, a three-dimensional roundness to the arms <coughs> and a little bit of color into things like the ear and so on of this particular design. Um, bokashi, it's a Japanese word that means gradation or shading. It's um, used in this print in two different ways. And I'll show you um, a bit of shading from the block that I'm printing tonight. There is bokashi in the print here on her ear, which is a bit more like carmine pink color than the, the slightly orangey color of the flesh tone. Can you see? There's a slight difference. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the nose, I've done a dotted line around there, and also a couple of areas here, around here, and around here, where I wanted the, the color to be paler. Do you see how the nose shadow is lighter mm -hmm. than the rest? I didn't want it to look like she had a very large nose. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I did uh, a Bokashi, a lighter shading with water to make the shadow on those areas paler than the shadow in the other parts. So there are two different kinds of bokashi in this particular print. There's a bokashi of different color and a bokashi of different shade. That's the final print. Now, demonstration. This is the point where I'm now going to start showing you the, the demonstration. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine.
keep it away from me. Um, I've, got, I've got two prints in my hand, which are what I'm basically showing you today. I'm going to do a different version of these prints. Um, this is a print I did a few years ago of orchids, so I'll do that so that everyone can see it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I did this in two color schemes because I was quite keen that we could actually can everybody hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was quite keen that I could have two different versions of this design. Um, I wanted to do something fairly small, and I wanted to do it in two different color schemes. So, there we, are. so two different color schemes. we will print it today again differently, but just for demonstration purposes. Um, this narrow format, if you're interested, is called Hosoban in Japanese, which means narrow, narrow print. Um, this is the block that I retrieved from the water just now. Still nice and wet. As you can see, in fact, this is a, a standard print size block. And so what I've done with it is I've divided it into three and three, so that I get six pieces. Now, from this, you may perhaps notice, you may not, but there, there is no key block. I carved the key block on a piece of cherry wood. And because of weight, I didn't bring it with me today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can only carry you know, maximum 25 kilos when I'm coming from England, so I didn't bring it. But I printed it onto the prints, and I'm going to show you. So it's already pre-printed. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of different colors on this. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll ink it up, and I'll print it from the, the paper that I've already got damped inside here. Um, the block, as you can see, is nice and wet. I am going to slightly dry it. This might be a moment when this is a kind of lid. Ah! Did anybody hear what I said it was earlier? Yeah. Magnolia. 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 Cherry. Magnolia. 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 It's Magnolia Plot. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, cherry <coughs> is, is expensive. So I only use that usually for the key block, which is the outline block. Um, I normally would use uh, Magnolia for most of the color blocks. You can still get quite a lot of detail with it, but it's less expensive. And in this case, it's, it's plywood, so it's a lot cheaper than using solid. I mean, solid, can, is it okay? Yes. Yes. Solid cherry is, uh, if, like this, this was probably, I don't know, like two or three dollars for that. If it was cherry wood, it would have been eighteen dollars, twenty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Magnolia doesn't get big enough for that this far north or maybe in the south, but that's but is this that is Japanese. Yeah. It's Japanese. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. imported from Japan. Yeah. And in fact, because it's ply, I imagine what they do is they they do it as a as a rotary thing, like they circulate the wood and cut it that way mm. when they're making the ply. So mm. yeah, it, the tree uh, yeah, the tree is not a solid piece. I couldn't have this in solid magnolia. It would be impossible. Right. So there we are. I think that'd be short. <laughs> I'm going to show you um, printing uh, the upper part, the, the first color on the, on the orchids, which here, it's a, it's a pale turquoise, and here is a pale lilac on this. It's the first color there. I'm actually going to print today with light yellow, just for something a bit different. Now, let me first of all check if that's fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to do two or three prints. But I'm not going to print, obviously, every color, because we have a lot of all that. But I want to show you how it is done. Now, I've got little corners of damp tissue in this case, but it would be normally just a piece of um, rag or something in my own studio. Why am I doing this? Not to keep it from drying out. No, it just doesn't slip. It, it adheres it to the surface, because now that's pretty sturdy. It's pretty stiff. It's not going anywhere. Um, when I start putting pressure with the barren, which is this thing, I don't want it moving around. Okay, so it needs to be sticking to the surface like that. Okay, um, this is <laughs> roughly set out more or less like it was in the in the photos. So I've got my barren here. These are two of the old-fashioned style of barren. Um, as I said, it's covered in a piece of bamboo sheath. That's that. I might not use those at all today. But I, I normally nowadays use this which is the ball bearing one, because you can get very good pressure from it. You can press super hard, and that's really good. Do you get a, a different technique from using those different types? You can do that. Um, upstairs, <laughs> upstairs you'll notice some of the prints have a sort of swirly printing in them. Mm -hmm. That's called Baron Sujizuri. And what they did was they used the very edge of the original Baron and printed that way instead of printing flat. 
So each of those lines of swirl is done by hand by the artist on each individual print, so they're all different. But with this, it's a lot easier to get that effect because you've got a lot more points that you can press onto it. So you can get Baron Suji, that line printing, quite fast. So it's useful for certain things like that. Yeah, it can definitely help. Why do you have those beach colors that coded so you know what image or? Is it leftover ink or? Here. Yeah. yeah, this is leftover from the, the original printing. So it's not that um, you're tied to using these colors only, it's just that that's what was printed from this block previously. Um, it corresponds to what's on the print. I'll show you on the other side when we come to that, that there's, um, there's the black from that and it stayed very much on the block because the block absorbs the black an awful lot. And what I'm going to print now, you can, I don't know if you can see, but that's slightly bluish here. Yeah. The color was, was actually this one that I printed second. Slightly lighter can come along. But we're going to print it in yellow, and you'll see that in fact it doesn't matter what's on it previously, because the yellow still comes through. So, to business. Is it watercolor? It is. It's, today it's, um, it's, a, it's a gouache. Yeah, so it's a water based ink. And it's also possible to use um, powder pigment or Japanese pigments. It, it can be anything, it depends on what pigment you want to use. That's the ink. I've just flipped onto it. This is the, you can't really see, that is the nori. So that's the rice paste. Nice and thick. It actually, it's slightly thick. It should be about the consistency of double cream, maybe. That's a little bit thick, but it's okay. It'll, be, it'll do for now. Look, a couple of little spots of that. Specifically, yellow brush. Okay, each color has its own brush. You don't want to mix colors because you end up with them being really muddy and dirty. So I've got each brush here marked with which color it's going to be printing. Okay, and you don't mix them up. So this is yellow. So the previous color doesn't ever bleed through to that color? It sometimes does. If it's a very strong color and you're doing the first one or two prints, it does sometimes bleed through. But does the nori help on that? The nori, no. The nori has no effect on that whatsoever. <laughs> the nori is to, to allow the colors when they're dry to be waterproof. Mm -hmm. okay, so they don't no, it doesn't prevent bleeding. What prevents bleeding is that the paper is sized before you start to work with it. So the sizing is the thing that stops the color bleeding into the paper. Uh, the size is, a, is an animal skin glue, and it's uh, applied with uh, alum, and then that stops it bleeding on the, the surface, the ink. Oh, bleeding up. Oh, bleeding up. No, 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 no. No, what should have happened is the block was washed afterwards, and any residue color should have gone. And then, of course, the water's, it's soaked in water anyway. So there should be no color left. <laughs> Famous lost words. <laughs> we shall see. Is there a special kind of paper that Yes. This is the special kind of paper that we use. Um, this is handmade Japanese paper. The fiber is called kozo. It's, um, it's a slightly thin, sort of stick-like plant. And the thin parts are used for it. What they do is they cut the, the thin sticks, they strip off the bark, and inside is a very fibrous center. And that's what's used to make this paper. You can come afterwards and handle the paper, it's perfectly fine. As you can see on this one, I've pre-printed the outline. Okay? I did this really just to save time. It's printed from the, um, the key block, and I printed it in two colors, because I knew I was going to use yellow. So we've got yellow around about the flower heads, and green in the lower part. I'm going to print yellow and green on top to show you how it works. Right. Can you step back a little and ask the alum that's the uh, mm. uh, that's mixed with the size. Sizing is applied with. Does that have any effect on the holding of the colors? Ah, uh, I might color? do. But I mean, actually, it does very, in marbling. Yeah, yeah. In dying fat. It might do. Um, it could be that that's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I never thought about that, but it could be because the paper has to be sized with both size and alum each time. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's a possibility. Yeah. I also thought the alum was just to dry out the side so it wasn't sticky, but I think you're wrong. It has to, because mm. it bonds with the pigment. Yeah, and yeah, it could be that. There's my print. Okay, quite a small one. This is uh, much smaller than a standard size print, obviously. But nonetheless, here and here, I've got the kento, which is the areas of registration. Okay? So first of all, that's going to go in the left, uh, sorry, the right hand side. I hold it with my thumb. It's going to go in the left hand side and hold it. And draw. If you've seen the video upstairs, uh, Mr. Scholl's doing his thing, it's exactly the same thing. Corner, corner, draw. Right. 
That is not printed. <laughs> what did he do? Yeah. Um, the, the surface is damp. Okay, so what I've done is I've just quickly pressed it so that the print sticks into place. You can see if I do that, it's not, I'm pulling it, but it's not moving. Okay, it's in place. I'm going to take that and put it down, and then I'm going to print with this. I feel like a magician. I'm going to take this. And <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what on earth is that? Classic. Yeah. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> no, it's. <laughs> Sorry? Is that you want to the paper? Exactly. That's exactly it. Well, but what did they do before plastic? Well, what did they do before plastic? <laughs> no. Does anybody have an idea? An about the paper? About the piece of paper. Yes, but specially treated. Do you know about this? No. Does anybody know what a mino is? Yes. You would check. Not Not a mino, but a mino. No. Um, in Japan, they used to have uh, a way of waterproofing paper by treating it with persimmon juice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the, the first yellow, okay? I'm going to do once more on the same print, then we'll move on to other things, okay? So that's the, the yellow on there. How long does it take to dry? Not very long. It, it's really quick. Uh, normally I find within an hour or so, if you leave it in open air, within an hour it's not dry. If I'm printing colours, I like to print one colour per day. And so dry it out overnight and then damp it in the morning, work it down and dry it. It's, it's a sort of running process. So, back to this. Same thing again. Ink flicked on. Nori? It's amazing how little paint. Doesn't need very much. No, you really don't need very much. A little bit of Nori. Brush, rub, rub, rub. What you want to do is to try, obviously, to get a fairly even and smooth um, application of ink. So, number two. All that's in there, basically, there's there's newsprint, which is damped, and then the, the prints themselves are laid between it, just in order to get nice and, you can see it's nice and floppy. Mm -hmm. and that allows it to, uh, to absorb the color into the depth of the paper. How do you have to pack the car so that the paper doesn't go not, into the Not terribly deeply. I think people assume that it's got to be very deep. It, that's probably about 16th or, I don't know, an eighth of, a, of an inch. Not very deep. I mean, you, you, you can come and examine the block after. It's not very deep. Um, there's no real benefit in carving it super deep as long as you know where you're going to be pressing. So once you've printed it once or twice, you know the areas where it's going to print, and so then it's, it's fairly straightforward. Now, can everybody see? I'm going to lift this. Can you see that? You can see right through it. So you can see basically where it's printed. What's happened is that the ink's gone right into the depth of the paper so that we know that it's properly printed. If it was still pale, it wouldn't have properly printed, and we'd have to press it a bit more. Um, it's a circular motion, obviously, in, in printing, and that gives you the final effect. Okay, so that's, that's that. You can come and examine it afterwards. <laughs> I won't hide it, I promise. So, what I'm gonna do is move away from that and move to that. So we're gonna print a little bit of green. Just for convenience sake, I'm going to print from the same piece of the block. I could easily move on to another piece, but we'll print from the same piece just because it's there. Um, I've mixed up a green already, obviously. Now, green and some nori. Uh, I'm going to take a green brush this time. Obviously, no mixing of br brushes. You have to keep each brush separate. So that's the green. Is it equal parts of, uh, no, of nori? The starch? What's it called? Nori. 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 <laughs> no, it's not quite equal. Um, usually it's more ink than nori. If you use too much nori, what happens is you get a lot of the colour spreading out. Because the nori itself is quite creamy and thick, whereas this ink is quite thin. So you want a bit less of nori than, than of ink, if possible. Who signs the work when there's a publisher, a carver, a printer, and a, a designer? That's a good question. Who signs it? The, the guy with the money, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good answer. 
<laughs> the guy with the bar. Um, yeah, usually the, the print then becomes known as the work of the artist. Whoever's, whoever's the publisher it's, is the guy who's come up with the money, and it's, it's you know, obviously it's his print to an extent, but the person who has actually created the, the design is the person who's known as the, the creator of it, the artist of it. Um, we don't talk about prints. For example, I, I mentioned Watanabe Shusabara, who was the, the most famous publisher of the 1920s, 30s period. We don't talk about a Shusabara print, we talk about a Shinsui print or a Hasui print or a print by another artist. So it's the, it's the artist who's the named person, not the, the publisher. Those other Japanese characters on the print itself, mm. that's your signature? Okay, so seven years. At the bottom here, I've got, so my surname is Bini. And that's bin me in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a little seal that reads bin. How do you get the seal? Is that specific to you or? It's actually, it is specific to me and uh, it's printed off on here from a carved wooden block. Um, I had the actual seal that made the first impression and it's carved through. Um, and it was made for me by a seal carver in Kyoto. So I, I gave him my character and I said I want a seal and he carved it. So. It's like a chocolate. It's like a chocolate. It's, a, it's exactly well, a chocolate. The man that brings the money. Yes. And he gets the artist. Can the artist say, all right, I'm not going to work with this person. Of course he can. No, I'm not going to. I mean, the artist, to, to a large extent, has a, a, a bit of control in this. I've just printed the, the green of the leaves on this. <coughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to print one where I show you just the color, and then I'm going to put one where I put the several different colors that were printed together. Okay. So. You can handle that with your fingers. No, I can't touch it. Of course I can. Yes, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's solid now, because what's happened is the color's gone into the depth of the paper. It's not sitting on the surface at all. It's also alum. The alum has bonded it chemically. You love alum, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're <laughs> madam <of> alum. <laughs> no, you're right. It's exactly that. Um, the the combination of, of nori and alum is probably what makes it nice and solid. You're absolutely right. And there's no residue of the yellow came across because you didn't well, have anything if, between. If you look at this one, I have printed yellow on this one. Oh. So what I've done is I'm going to print one with just the color, and then one where I put all the colors. I'm only going to print four colors today, but I'm going to put all of them on one. But that, where you had it just lying on the yellow that you had just printed was nothing. No, you, sh you shouldn't get any residue. It shouldn't off print. No. What I'm going to do, I shall lay these. Yeah. If you wanted to get the Bokashi, the yeah. shading, yeah. would you control where you brush? Yes, I'm going to show you that. Oh. Yeah, please be patient. <laughs> As we say in Scotland, hold your horses! <laughs> yes, no, I will show you that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the background in two colours and show you contrasting colours so that you can see the, where, the, where the shading is, is happening and how it's done. I'm just going to print one with green, and this is going to be the print that has the yellow already on it because we're going to start to build that one up in multiple colours, okay? So again, same old story, colour and then noni. This is not a very big area. As you can see, it's fairly small, but it's nice to get a nice even, if possible, a nice even application. That was a print. You see this yellow on it already? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the green onto this one. This is going to be the one that's got all the colors together. As I say, I'm only printing four today, but the, the final print actually has about 12, about 12 or 14 colors on it. For, for quite a small print, it's quite a lot of colors. But this is fairly typical in Japanese prints. You find that even very small prints have just as many colors as a very large prints, just the scale that's different. Do most current artists do all this stuff themselves now? For the most part, yes, because um, paying someone to do your carving or your printing for you is very expensive. I mean, there are professional carvers and printers, but they're not cheap. And most artists, obviously, are not wealthy enough <laughs> to afford to get somebody to do it. So here we've got the yellow at the top, the green at the bottom. I'm going to add a background color to this just in a moment. Now, we talked about shading. <laughs> um, I'm going to flip this block over. And on the other side, you can see this area here is the background area. Okay, if I put that beside it, you see that the black is shaded into gray in this particular case. We actually, I played with this earlier today with the School of the Arts, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and I got some of the kids to print off from it. So it's got a bit of color on it, which I'm gonna wipe off, but we're, we're gonna print from that too. What we're gonna do, 
I'm going to print the background in two colors. I've mixed up a, an orange and a black. Okay, so we're going to do the colors, these colors, as the background colors, just for fun. Why not? Let's do that. Um, I'm just going to dry this off a little bit. Now, earlier today we were using yellow on the background, so there's a bit of yellow residue on this. But as I say, it's going to be black and orange this time. Now, normally I would have a, a separate brush, which is not a printing brush, in a little um, cup or mug or something. And I would put a little spot of water into it. Okay, And that would be the brush that I would damp the block with in order to do shading or bokashi. Okay. I don't have that today. What I have is, is another printed brush. It actually says blue on it. But I'm not printing blue today. And I'm just using this for water. <coughs> to get a bit of water. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just ordinary water. This is, as you can see, probably quite filthy water. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> Get it. I wish it were. <laughs> right. All I've done is I've slightly damped that with water. Okay. Um, if you can, if you can see closely to this, it will help. Here, there are two marks on this block. So you see, I've carved in two marks. This is the benefit of sitting closed in my tell you. There are two marks there. This is where we're going to put the, the bokashi, the shading. Okay, that just gives me an idea. What I'm doing is I'm putting water on the block. There's no ink on it just now, there's just water. Right? Then I'm going to put actually I'm going to put some black on the top. <laughs> this, this is really like a country trick. This is either going to go really well or really badly. <laughs> Where is that egg and why is it on my face? <laughs> and I'm going to put some orange at the bottom. Okay, just as I say, just for fun. We'll have a black and orange background. Mm -hmm. Right, there's the two colors. There's black here and orange there. Okay, I'm going to put a spot of nori up there and a spot of nori there. <laughs> 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 That's so good. That is so much fun. Right, <laughs> this is my black brush. It's slightly wider than that one. And I chose this one because it's a slightly bigger area, so I thought it might be better to bring a bigger brush. So I did pre-plan slightly, and it doesn't seem like it, but there we are. Right, inking up the black. For those of you who can see this, you know that it's inked because there's a slight sheen on the surface. It's not wet, but it's a bit like rain on the surface of the pavement a couple of hours after it's rained or an hour after it's rained. It's just damp but not wet. What you don't want is to have areas of wetness on the surface because that's not going to print. All you'll do is you'll pick up a lot of mess. So there's the orange. Now, I'm using the edge of the brush just to shade it into the area where it was wet. And I know this because of those two carved marks. So I get an idea of that. And I'm then going to take the black brush again and just bring it down into the same area. Okay? <laughs> Don't laugh, please. <laughs> now, the first one I'm going to do is. It's fine, it's fine. Thank you for leaping to my aid. He's <laughs> a conservator at heart. <laughs> oh my god, that's Japanese prints! <laughs> Kento, right hand first one, left hand first second. There we are. Now it's dropped into place. Now, that's not printed, obviously. I put it into place and fitted it. Now there's not plastic. There we are. Now, you'll see this coming through. Oh my god, look at that color. That's fantastic. This may not be the most beautiful aesthetic print in the world. It's fun to do. Can you see it coming through? Yeah. Feel free to stand. Actually, I'm going to, I'll, I'll lift the block so everybody has a chance to see it once I've actually printed it. Okay, from this stage, this is partly printed, right? And you can see here where the color has properly penetrated, and here not quite yet. Okay, so that means I have to press a little bit more where it's paler. I need to get the constant feel of the real surface. So a bit more pressure there. 
<clears throat> what normally happens is it prints quite nicely at the edges of the block because the edges are quite open and full of, of water. And then the center of the block prints a bit more difficult. Is air conditioning mm. Yeah, it does. I, I've never used air conditioning. Or, or in fact, during the winter, not heating either. My studio's like a nice box. <laughs> What I'm going to do actually before I leave this one, I'm going to print this a second time because this black, as you can see, is quite grayish. Yeah. This was the first pull from the block. This very often happens that the first color is a bit weak and you want to put a bit more color into it to get a proper impression. So I'm going to, I'm going to print the black again. So I'll do the same as I did before with my brush. A bit of Bukashi. So water here first. A bit more black. It's not that I'm a massive perfectionist, but you know, I would quite like it to look okay. So, yeah. <laughs> actually, I think part of the, the thing that printmaking has taught me is that you kind of have to be a perfectionist. You have to be quite fussy about how things are. You can't be as slapdash as I used to be. Right. I'm not. I'm not in this case printing the orange because uh, I'm just intensifying the black. So we will just pop it on. And you should, with luck, see a slight difference this time. Um, darker colors, obviously, um, once you've printed two or three of them, the color starts to. So it's a bit like. When I was learning this process, this friend of mine said, well, it's a bit like making a crepe or like a pancake or something. Mm -hmm. The first one or two are usually mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. But once you're in the flow of it, it starts to get a bit better. So when you're printing, you know, normally a printer is not printing two prints or three prints. They're <coughs> printing 100 or 200 prints. So the first two or three, yeah, they're usually wasters. Then the rest of them are, are ones that they can fill into the proper edition. So there are going to be things you can throw away from this. Certainly today. Mm -hmm. but I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very often in the black of the prints upstairs, the black is super, super intense. And what happened is that the artist would, so the printers would print it three times to get very intense black. Um, black printed once is always a little bit grayish. However thick the ink is, it's always grayish. And today I'm not using sumi, I'm using a, a water based uh, a gouache. So it's never going to be as super, super intense as it will be later. But what else? the same for the red and blue? Um, to a lesser extent, but yes. I mean, the darker the color is, um, the better it is if you print it multiple times. Who asked that question? Yeah. Um, so for example, upstairs there's a, a print by Shinsui of a girl putting on makeup before the dance, which has a fantastic red background. That's definitely printed at least twice or three times. Probably more. Probably more. But three times already is a lot. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I've, I've done prints myself with red backgrounds where you want to get the intensity of the red and you have to print it twice or three times. The more often you print this, it goes further into the back. Paper. That's kind of the idea. I mean, basically, you're, you're putting layer upon layer of color, and so you're, yeah, you're pushing the color into the depth of the paper. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, what I'm going to do, and now, obviously, these are the, the ones that we've printed just a single color. I'm going to do the one where I've got the other colors on as well. No, we'll crash it first of all. Yeah. A bit of water. Black. Can I ask you a question about the carvings? Yeah, please. So you said in the beginning there's a paper. Yeah. And it's put down, and that is essentially ruined. It's destroyed. It's destroyed okay. with the carving process. So do you yeah. have multiple pieces of paper for each one nope. of those sections? Nope. There's a step that you've you missed. Mm. Well, the step was that the um, the carver carves out that ink drawing into a block, which is called the key block, which is, I still got one here, which I haven't printed yet, which is what that was right from the start. Do you remember I showed yeah. you? Yeah. Look, that, that's the key block printed onto paper. Okay. Okay. So basically, there would be quite a lot of these, yeah. and they would be handed to the artist, and he would color each one with where he wanted the color to go. So, for example, there'd be green on the leaves, or there'd be yellow on the flowers, or there'd be black and orange in the background, whatever. And each one would be then stuck face down on a piece of wood, and you see it's transparent. And then the carver would carve through it, and that would be the block. Again. 
So it's not that the artist does all of that and then hands it to the carver, the artist then has to work with the block that the carver has carved. So it's so the it, carver might like carve part of a, a design multiple times. Oh yeah, many, many times very often. In fact, if you look in detail at that uh, the set of Shinsu blocks upstairs, there's a very interesting piece where you've got just the eyebrows and the inner rim of the eye on the block to intensify the dark shading around the, the eye and the, the eyebrow. And that's amazing because they've already been printed from the key block, but there's another area carved exactly the same just in order to intensify the color. Yep. Which, of course, is what makes it quite labor intensive mm -hmm. in the end, that you're, you're doing multiple printings on the same area of the block. And how long does it take for the carver and the artist mm. collaborating to come up with the, you know, the key block and... Yeah, yeah, FedExing is back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> in the, the days before FedEx. Well, really, no, it's a question of how long is a piece of string. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It can be any length of time. If, if they're all working very closely together, it can be fast. If they're working quite far apart, if they've got other projects, it can be a long process. I mean, the, the, the thing that takes the time is not necessarily the, the work itself, it's the communication between different people. So, one of the great things about doing it all for myself is that I don't have to worry about other people's choices. I just do it. So, what makes the paper stick to the wood when you're carving through it? Oh, it's, it's stuck on with the same, the same glue. Um, the nori that I've got here is, is slightly diluted. It's like cream. The one in here, you see that? Mm. Looks like Vaseline or something. It's the same. It's, 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 yeah, it's very thick. That's what they use. And um, what they, they, they used to do in the old days, they, it's not done so much nowadays, but they would apply a little bit to the heel of the hand and then rub it on the surface so you get a thin, smooth application on the wood and then stick the paper down on top of it. That was the usual method. Onto the bare wood. Onto the bare wood, yeah. The wood at that point is um, just plain wood. It's absolutely flat. And then you can see the, the outline through yeah. that kind of it's like It's like seeing that. You can see through it. Obviously, here you can't see the yellow so clearly, but they've printed it in, in grey, usually or black, so you can see it perfectly. Um, and there's a special kind of paper that they use, which is in almost in two layers. It's quite thin, and what happens is you, you pull the top layer off, and then the bottom layer is super, super thin. Then you can easily see all the detail and just carve straight through. Now, this one is the one that I've already got the um, yellow flower heads and the, the leaves on. So it should look a little bit more like a, a real print. Can you apply the ink? Do you apply it to a certain... In what sense? Um, just as a, a rhythm for spreading the ink, you always apply it on the left side or both No, no, you just want to randomly spread it out over the whole surface and then, then, then smooth that out with the brush. Okay. Um, yeah, it, no, there's no specific place that you have to put it. No, and because what you're doing with the brush is you're covering the entire surface of the wood. So even the bits that are carved down need to be covered in ink. So you're just covering the whole thing with, with the same ink, basically. Now, I'm probably going to print this black a second time, because, hey, that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> but, so that's what it looks like. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to print the black again, just to give it a nice bit of intensity. How do you clean your brushes? Just with water. Even the nori does a stick, I mean, is it Well, if you notice, this is not a brush. No, I meant everything. Oh, I see, after that, no, no. As long as, you, as long as you clean them quite soon after you've finished it. <coughs> if you wait till they're dry, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because, you know, rice is absolutely solid. Do you like leave them in water or something? What I, yeah, what I normally do is I would stick them in water and let a lot of the, the stuff just drop out of it. Um, and then just give it a good rinsing in water. I don't use uh, glue or, uh, sorry, I don't use soap or anything. I just you know, make sure that it's been properly rinsed in water. It, it comes out. It comes out without too much trouble. How do you figure out the proper placement of that right angle and the straight edge for the registration? Ah, well, that's a very good question. The, the answer to that really is, do you want to have margins or not? And if you want to have margins, how wide is your margin going to be? That's really the question. Because it's, if you can see on this design, there is, uh, obviously, there's a, take that, there's a, there's a margin. 
yeah. around there. Yeah. So it's really how far away from the design do you put the, the well, I mean, with, with different colors mm. and the different places on the wood, don't you have to have those those registrations? No, they must be consistently always in the same place in relation to the design. Yeah, yeah. So how do you how do you how do you do that? <laughs> Shout <laughs> with your thumbs. Yeah. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> no. From the from the key lock. So you have those cards already, and then they transfer the. All That's the exactly it. The key block is the main thing, right? So you've got the key block which has the, the two corners carved into it already, right? When you're doing the color separations, the printer, sorry, the carver pulls different pools and the artist fills in the color. But he also includes the corners in his printing off onto the paper. So on each piece of paper, you've got the design plus you've got the two corners, the, the edge and the corner, anyway. And when those are stuck down on the block, the carver then carves them again in exactly the same place. So that's why, if you look at this block, uh, and you can come and see it afterwards, each of these has the corner and the straight edge in exactly the same place because it's been where the, the print has, <coughs> has gone down and it's still gone to the surface. So you always have to use the same size paper? Preferably. <laughs> <laughs> you can try different sizes. Well, I was just thinking about plain. <laughs> <laughs> do, you yeah, yeah. your, do you cut your paper or tear it? Oh, never tear it. it. Mm -hmm. He tried to tear Japanese paper. No, 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 no. Bad idea. No. No. No Japanese paper. Um, I might give you a piece of paper to try tearing if you like. You will find it a lot easier. Um, the, the, the rough edge that you can see there, and on this one down this edge, is a natural edge of the paper. That's not torn. Okay? And on this print, you see it's a straight edge because I've cut it. This just happened to be at the edge of a sheet. It's not torn. Um, Japanese paper is chosen because the, the, the fibers of the paper are super long, and that's what gives it strength and durability. And you can't, you can tear it, but you end up with a horrible edge. It's useless. So yeah. it's much better to uh, to cut it to get a nice sharp edge. Is this paper thinner than just the standard printing paper? This is standard printing paper. This is normal paper that I'm using. Well, Japanese, the Japanese paper is a thinner or standard size also. Oh, you mean, it's sorry, do you mean, well, well, no, the thickness is, this paper. is standard yeah. paper. This is a, a normal Japanese printing paper that I'm using today. This is what most of the stuff upstairs is printed on. It's exactly the same stuff. Oh. Well, that's not handmade paper, that's factory paper. Which one? This? Yes, yes. handmade. handmade. Oh. I don't use factory made paper. This is all handmade paper. But in the West, they yeah. do use, uh, use a rag paper. I don't care about the West. It's <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> Wait. What do these Westerners know? <laughs> oh. Okay. Hooray! He actually did it. It's amazing. Okay. This is obviously only four colors. Um, we've got the yellow that we printed on the the, the petals in the first case, the green, and then the black shading into orange. Uh, in total, as I said, this print is about 14 colors in, in, when it's all finally done. And what I'll do, all of this is laid out here, you can come and have a look. Right. And actually handle the paper, you can have a look at the, the knives, and you can see the prints and how they're different to each other. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.